Koe Koe, this is Stephen Ojiri, and it is February 19, 2017. And uh, this is going to be just a ramble for whoever, however long. I just wanted to touch on a few things. Um, as you guys know, I basically sign on to Facebook like once a month. And once a month, I sort of get an idea of what people have been talking about and what's been going on. And then I'll just make a video sort of responding to the general gist of it. <clears throat> so the first thing that I would like to do is I saw the video by Anthony where he finally got around to reading Crested Kimono. Uh, it's a book that I've been suggesting that people read for a while. Um, Anthony's finally went ahead and read it. Some other people have asked me about it, but it's by Masayuki Hamabata, and it's called Crested Kimono, and it discusses modern-day powerful Japanese families, but the way it discusses it is in is showing how the old system of the Ie, the house, pre-Meiji, right, the house of uh, Bushi houses, how the Bushi house the model of how that works still continues today in powerful Japanese families or family Japanese families that have business, power, authority. Most of those families are Shizoku or uh, again there's no legal reality to Shizoku anymore because it was deliberately left out of the constitution in the 40s so there's no legal standing but prior to that there was legal standing but because the new Japanese constitution did was silent on the topic of Shizoku, there's literally just no legal basis for it as a legal as a legal term or a legal identity. So now it is a cultural identity. So Shizoku is a cultural phenomenon, no longer a legal phenomenon, because there literally are no laws that address the topic. And that's what's called the law is silent for those of you who are familiar with how law works, you understand what it means to say the law is silent on the matter. And for those of you that don't know what that means, when the law is silent on a matter, it means that the law has literally doesn't, there's nothing to say, nothing applies. The law does not address this. Therefore, it's not addressed. It's not a legal issue. The way law works really is like, uh, you know, people commit, an in, there's an infinite amount of behaviors or activities that a person can do. And if the law speaks on it, then the law controls it. If the law is silent on the matter, then the law doesn't control it. And it's up to whoever is in charge to figure out what to do. So, um, because Japanese law is silent on the matter of Shizoku currently, Shizoku is not a legal entity. It's not a legal term. It doesn't have any legal ramifications. Um, this is, in in a sense, this is roughly also the same way that even if, with the idea of like a bushi class, even if you want to disregard, like because I've said before, you know, with uh, like Emperor Meiji should, Emperor Meiji wasn't a legit emperor because he was a northern court emperor, so therefore his edict against the bushi is uh, illegal and irrelevant. The, the fact that Japan is no longer a country that is actually run by the emperor, but it is a country that is run by an elected government, because Japan is a government now, an actual elected government system, that the constitution that was drafted in the 40s is silent on the matter of Shizoku, and it is silent on the matter of Bushi. Therefore, Bushi and Shizoku both cannot possibly be modern day legal terms or have legal ramifications existing or have any sort of legal or political pull or power because the law is silent on those terms. So I need to correct that because when I said that Emperor Meiji has no authority to um, silence or dissolve the Bushi people were thinking I was saying, oh, then I'm saying that the Bushi still exist. But even and I'm kind of saying that from 1868 at least until uh, the the constitution was was done in the 40s because uh, and I didn't and I don't mean that to be a reality I mean that as a as a theoretical reality theoretically you could make the argument 
that the people that were identified as Shizoku after 1868 should actually have been Bushi because Meiji really didn't have the authority to dismiss the class or to dissolve the class because he wasn't the legitimate emperor. That having been said, even as a theoretical reality, by the time we hit the constitution being drafted in the 40s, we say Japan has changed from an imperial-based government to an elected government. The, the entire governing body of the country has changed. And at that point, that governing body is silent on the matter of Bushi, and it is silent on the matter of Shizoku, so therefore there's no legal reality to Shizoku, there's no legal reality to Bushi within modern Japan. So that's an important point to make. Um, now, getting back to Crested Kimono, the so it's about Shizoku or Bushi style of genealogy and power structure but it's within modern day Japanese families of power families that own big businesses families that have quite a lot of people and material and power and money to manage and how those operate the same way that a Shizoku house operates the same way that a Bushi house operates and like I said many of those families who are who have these modern day powerful houses if you trace most of their lineage you'll find that they were Shizoku you'll find that they were Bushi and this is the reason that they continue to be powerful in the modern day is because it, these are te these are time tested systems you know this is how Bushi houses have maintained and governed themselves and organized themselves for a thousand years and it's been successful so it continues to be successful even in the modern day market modern day government it continues to be successful. So that book, Crested Kimono, goes into that and explains that Crested Kimono also goes into a very, very important factor, which Anthony did not cover in his video because it wasn't really relevant in the video. But it also goes into the the immensely important need to understand the difference between public appearance versus personal feelings, right? About And, and that's not, not only just in one's personal life. Like, for example, you have your own personal feelings and then you have your public appearance. Your public appearance has to be a certain way that may or may not match your personal feelings. But that's how society runs. Particularly, that's how Japanese society runs. And I would argue that Western culture actually follows a similar model, except Western culture is more... People in the West are more apt to break that pattern, and they're more apt to throw their personal opinion out into the public sphere. But you find many successful people in the West who understand this principle of the outer and inner, and they have, a, they have their inner feelings, they have their personal feelings, and then they have their professional feelings, they have their professional stance. So that in that way, many people who are successful professionals and academics understand this principle of the public image and the personal feelings, because they, this, this is how you get power and this is how you manage power is by having your personal feelings that and the, your personal feelings is a way for you to nourish yourself right to keep your own sanity but then at the same time you can't you have to appear a certain way to other people in order to maintain and nourish your your power in the world right so for example if you really really feel a certain way about a particular topic but you know that if you speak out on it and you continuously speak out on it it's going to cost you time it's going to cost you money and authority and respect it's probably best for you to publicly look a certain way and then privately you can engage in behaviors and activities which undermine that which you don't really respect but you can't just sacrifice yourself you can't sacrifice your family you can't sacrifice your house for to you know publicly constantly putting your foot in your mouth or putting uh, putting yourself into a position where you constantly are going to get damaged politically and powerfully you know in in terms of power structures in terms of power management constantly doing things that is going to ruin you and ruin your house and again like i said professional people and academics understand this they understand the uh, the inner and outer but this book goes into that in detail about how powerful Japanese families have this, this this display of public versus private and how 
many Western people are initially, you know, taken affront by by the fact that someone in private will think and behave a certain way, but then in public will think and behave in a totally different way. And it's all about power management. It's all about power management. Again, it's not a foreign concept to the West because, like I said, professionals and academics understand that your personal feelings and your public image cannot be the same. They have to be managed independently. This is how you get power. This is how you maintain power. And uh, not just in personal lives, too, but it discusses how that also works within the houses. So, like, for example, you have the main branch of the family, of the house, and then you have the branch families. So the house is all the families. The house is Ie, and then the, the families is Uchi, right? And so the Uji may have the family, Uji, the, in, the independent, the, the, the small distinct units, families, the Uji, may have a personal way of being and a personal way of behaving and a personal way of feeling and thinking. But, and they do that when it's just them. But whenever they're engaged socially in front of other people or interacting with the main branch, et cetera, et cetera, they have to put on the public face. So, for example, it's very possible that one of the, the, the branch families, one of the Uji, doesn't really like the main, the main family. Like, they don't get along well. So when the Uji is, when the members of the family, the Uji, are like uh, just hanging out by themselves, they might very well shit talk the main branch. But when the main branch, when a representative from the main branch comes to visit, they have to put on the face of subservient and politeness. Because again, it's all about managing the power that you have. It's about being situationally aware of all of the factors around you and not being a fucking idiot and sticking your foot in your mouth and saying the wrong shit at the wrong time and losing power. It's all about the management and the maintenance of power. So that's basically what the book Crested Kimono is about. Um, uh, I think now I think that Crested Kimono is extremely easy to read. Um, Anthony said it was a, a little bit more complicated than than I let it on to be. That it's an acad it is an academic level book, but it's a really easy to read academic book. So, oh maybe I misunderstood Anthony in that part of the video. Um, but I'm going to reiterate: it's a really easy book to read. Everything is presented with diagrams. The language is very, very, um, it's not convoluted. Yes, it's definitely like a university book, like a college level book, a university level book, but it is so fucking easy to read. So I would highly advise, and I don't know Masayuki Hamabata, never met him, never talked to him, but if, but his book is fucking great. So, um, you can buy it, you can rent it from a library, whatever, but I would, you know, I'd suggest you will really understand. And I've said this, I've been, been advising people to learn, to read books and to research and to understand how the Japanese house works. And again, by house, I don't mean like a physical structure. I mean that like in, like Anthony in his video even said, Europeans actually have that same word, the house of this or the, the, you know, the house of Tokugawa, the house of Toyotomi house being a massive power structure you know it, it's the main family with all the branch families and together all of these families combined create the house of something the house of tokugawa is created from the main tokugawa family and all of the tokugawa branch families matsudaira families technically because really only i mean we know that tokugawa is actually matsudaira but anyway um that's a whole, that's another topic. No need to go into that. But or the House of Toyotomi, right? Well, actually, House of Toyotomi is not a great example either, because it wasn't like there was a whole bunch of branch families for Toyotomi. It was one of the reasons he, after he died, all his, the whole shit with Segigahara happened because there's <laughs> there's no real house there. There's like one family. the The House of Toyotomi was like one family. Um. <coughs> but anyway point of the matter is is that the house so you have the house which is the main branch the main family and all the branch families so you have the families and then they're all connected to each other in a power structure and the overall 
organization is called the house, right? So like the house of Nojiri, which is actually the house of Kumazawa. But anyway, um, so there's a classic example, right? The house of Kumazawa. Within the house of Kumazawa are the Nojiri. Um, so the that video was good. And I also like in that video how he finally like, I have been saying for years, you know, like that after 1868, there's a portion of of samurai society, Shizoku society that continued to live very bushy like lifestyles up in Hokkaido, up in the north for a, for a while. So it was good to finally hear Anthony <laughs> like um what is the word? Like finally actually publicly say in a video, a public video that even though 1868 is the official ending marker, that Bushi slash Shizoku lifestyle continued on in the North for a number of years. That was fucking amazing that he finally said that on a public video. Thank you, Anthony. Hooray. But yes, uh, in my last video, I talked about that. Um, for example, the Tonden Hei, how I want to, how I've got this book project, this book being written. I'm writing a book on the Tonden Hei. Uh, the whole idea about Bushi or Shizoku, whichever, you know, technically I'm Shizoku, you know, we could, again, theoretically we could argue Bushi, but to be safe, let's just go with the standard term Shizoku. So Shizoku family is going up to Hokkaido and becoming Tondenhei. And Tondenhei is like, again, it's like a militant farmer security force part of the we you know part of the time like they're given acreage and their job is to farm the acreage so they have to clear the land they have to turn the land into a farm but at the same time they also have to be the militant security force for the territory so they still participate in in they still do all the military stuff they scout they patrol, they train, they talk about war tactics, they train in war tactics, they practice war tactics. It just again in the eighteen in the eighteen seventies, eighteen eighties, they're also incorporating non traditional things like firearms or Western tools, Western weapons, Western gear, because they have it now, right? But the mindset is still there. They are not soldiers in the in the in the enlisted conscripted army I should say conscripted because as most some of you are aware that Japan had that whole conscription thing but um, after the Meiji restoration and then you know because Japan wants to make sure it has enough armed forces it's not like they just have enlisted peasantry or commoners they actually there's a conscription uh, a, a draft if you will of you have to serve so much time blah 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 but anyway these guys in Hokkaido the Tondenhei are they and they are conscripted eventually but prior to formally being conscripted they are sent up there with the objective with the mission of basically being um uh, how do i say this uh i can't say the word um r u r a l in english i can't really pronounce rural i can't really say the word um Anyway, with being country samurai, for lack of G samurai, basically, um, up in Hokkaido, they have to run farms, but they also have to be the militant security force to protect Hokkaido. And who are they protecting Hokkaido from? They're protecting Hokkaido from the Russians, flat out from the Russians. Japan is concerned that Russia will try to invade down and through Hokkaido. So they send all these guys up there, all these Shizoku up there to just be warriors to protect, to protect against Russia. And then what eventually happens, like I said in the last video, is uh, during, as you know, the Western provinces put Meiji into power. And then when Emperor Meiji or fake Emperor Meiji turned on the Western provinces, because remember, they originally put the emperor in power to prevent Western influence in the country. But then Emperor Meiji and his government, after they came into power, 
turned pro-Western. And the pro-Western turn plus stopping the stipends of samurai and all of that stuff, stopping the stipends of the Shizoku, basically allowing the peasantry to mock and make fun of the Shizoku, which I talked about in the previous video with people talking about Shizoku no Shoho, like, oh, the business skills of a Shizoku being like a catch-all insult and common uh, commoners would would uh, always blame the Shizoku for anything that went wrong because they were now legally allowed to. Like a commoner could could blame a Shizoku for something to go wrong without risk of law or beheading or anything like that. You know, so making fun of Shizoku became a very common thing. Japanese newspapers continuously blamed Shizoku for everything. Anything that went wrong was always a Shizoku's fault. A Shizoku because Shizoku were idiots. Shizoku don't know how to do anything. The country really, because remember, the majority of Japan is not made up of Shizoku. The majority of Japan is made up of commoners. So after the restoration, commoner J Japan went from being a Shizoku, a samurai Shizoku run country to being a country of merchants, a country of commoners. And they just like as a like as a fashion trend, as a as they just turned on the Shizoku and then the Shizoku lost money. They lost respect. They lost property. They lost power and then on top of that the emperor that they just helped put in power supported the commoners took the side of the peasantry took the side of the commoners and that caused that like um the whole like with saigo and his rebellion and the western provinces rebelling you know all the satsuma samurai rebelling after the restoration you know, there was a time period and then they rebelled, right? Because they got tired of the bullshit. They thought that they put Meiji in charge to sort of protect their status and to keep the Western expansion at bay. But then Meiji opened the doors to the West and then the Shizoku got completely shit on. So they rebelled. When they rebelled, then, then the Meiji government did go up to Hokkaido and pulled a bunch of the Tonden Hei and conscripted them into service. But because they were all Shizoku and they had been doing all of these war games and war training and tactics, most of the Tonden Hei who were who had been samurai of like middle, middle high, or middle low, middle, middle, middle high, higher rank, blah blah blah, um, weren't conscripted as like you know enlisted men they were inscript they were conscripted as officers so essentially the sons of merchants and farmers were the conscripts were like the 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 privates and and sergeants and whatever whereas the um the tondenhei and the other shizoku were were officers so what you saw was a lot of the Tonden Hei. So then what happened is, so for a period of time, they just basically continued a samurai way of living up in Hokkaido, make, tending to farms and just practicing, training, scouting, patrolling the north. And then uh, they were pulled into the whole Satsuma Rebellion where they served as officers. And then when that was finished, they went back to Hokkaido and continue to be Tondinhei. And then at a certain point when they started making more formal military, a portion of those Tondinhei would be would become a particular military unit. And I can't remember exactly what the designation is, but they were like the the Sapporo the Sapporo Bears or something like that was their was their little logo and it was like unit something 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 whatever. But not all the Tondinhei who had been doing Tondinhei lifestyle for twenty something years became part of the 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 Sapporo Bears or the Hokkaido Bears or whatever it is they're called. I, I need to learn that designation. There's an actual military unit from Hokkaido that the Tondinhei that went on to become formal members of the military like in the eighteen the eighties, nineties, something like that, about twenty years after um, there's a specific military unit and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been told the name, but I can't remember it right here making this video. And then many of those Tonden Hei who did not go on to be formal permanent military members, um, just basically went on as Shizoku as a, um, but then they got involved in other, other business ventures and things like that. 
So, um, and that's because at a certain point, you know, the Japanese military goes from like being, a, you know, like samurai and Ashigaru to being a conscript army to being a more permanent, well-established army. And during that course of time, certain people, you know, become professional soldiers. And then some people like they, certain Shizoku just go on and they become owners of businesses and things like that. So most of the Tonden Hei go on to own businesses and things like that. But some of them... Uh, like I said, choose to go off and be professional soldiers. But that's like 20-something years of after the Tonden Hei are established. Anyway, so long story short, okay, so that's rambling on. But long story short, um, there's definitely this massive dynamic of samurai culture and life still existing in Hokkaido, you know, well after the restoration. And, and one can argue that for a considerable length of time, it was really not touched upon by a Western expansionism, even though now it's true though that Hokkaido, when they initially sent all of these Shizoku up there and then years passed where they just lived like Jizamurai, but then when they started bringing people in to fight the Satsuma rebellion and decided to start really um, putting infrastructure into Hokkaido, then interestingly enough, like the westernization of Hokkaido was instantaneous in the sense that when they started building buildings and building government offices in Hokkaido, they, they built them in Western style. So it's not the Hokkaido wasn't Hokkaido went from like a wild frontier to a Western style town or it was like Sapporo, for example, no, Hokkaido is not a town, it's the whole, the whole province, but like Sapporo, for example, went from being like a frontier to being a western town like it didn't have a transition it's not like it was a wild frontier and then it was like a frontier town and then it was like a traditional Japanese village and then it was a ja traditional Japanese city and then it was converted into a, um, a western town it basically went from like frontier village to western town so um, you'll see that in a lot like you could I mean if you don't trust me just go ahead just google the the, the, the oldest buildings in Hokkaido, and you'll see that they're done in Western architecture. A uh, true the the Tonden Hei's houses are traditional Japanese houses, but I'm saying like when the Meiji government decided to start dumping infrastructure into Hokkaido, they built Western style buildings, Western style roads, blah blah blah. It, they they didn't like try to do Japanese and then convert it to Western. They just went straight to Western. So you don't see a prolonged lingering of traditional Japanese-isms in Hokkaido for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that for a good, for a solid 10 years you do. And, um, and if the Meiji government hadn't tried to, hadn't developed Hokkaido instantly into a Western type industrialization, you would have seen Shizoku lifestyle lasting even longer like samurai lifestyle lasting even longer but i'm pretty sure that that's why the meiji government went straight to westernizing hokkaido because they realized that this sort of old samurai way was still existing in hokkaido and that if they didn't immediately jump to a western western style city that the that the samurai lifestyle which they had tried so hard to really do away with in on Honshu would have continued in Hokkaido far longer than it did. Do you see what I'm saying? That's an important point to understand. The Meiji government was invested in dissolving and, and doing away with samurai, which is one of the reasons why they allowed newspapers and commoners to just to really shit on the samurai history, the samurai image, the Shizoku uh, culture. Um, if you read, like, you just read some of the statements made by Meiji cabinet members when they when they when when they issue statements on the state of the Shizoku in Japan, they are brutal statements. They are not kind. They are not like uh, considerate. They are brutal. Most of the cabinet members who had come from family that you got to remember though there's shizoku families and then there's like whole kuge family like the court nobles and a lot of these guys are a lot of these meiji cabinet members are actually from not the not like buge or like warrior families but they're from like court noble families or they've been they've been 
They may not have been from them originally, but when they were hired into the Meiji cabinet, socially speaking, they become higher than what a samurai would have been. They would have been like court nobles. And so they, being higher than samurai in a social status within that regard, feel uh, apparently feel it okay to talk an inordinate amount of harsh shit on the Shizoku. And basically saying, uh, basically echoing the thoughts of the commoners that it's, Everything is the samurai's fault. Like all of Japan's problems are because of the samurai and because of the Shizoku. I'll make another video someday going into extreme details, but there are official statements that are given out by different, you know, ministers of different departments of the government, and they always just are harsh, just, uh, just really, really harsh toward the samurai, the Shizoku, and, and their existence essentially calling them a plague on society for lack of a better word um i don't i don't ever recall reading one official government statement from a cabinet member from various branches of the government everything from agriculture to you know defense whatever that didn't shit on the samurai or shit on the shizoku again it's one of the reasons that the satsuma rebellion occurred people just got tired of being told that they were the fucking problem of for everything right so anyway um, the Meiji government was really, really intent on stamping out samurai and shizoku and just doing away with that and moving to a merchant industrial society. So because they realized that Hokkaido was still harboring this samurai way of life, that is why they jumped straight to Western modernization when they decided to finally start developing Hokkaido. But in between the time period that they started developing Hokkaido in a very Western way and the restoration, you have a block of time there where the samurai way of life really just kind of continues. Anyway, and like I said, it's, it's really cool that Anthony finally publicly acknowledged that. <coughs> now, I want to move on to discussing the tongue-biting video. I know I've left some comments already on Facebook about that. Um... So I will just sort of summarize what I was saying in those comments. Um, yes, it's absolutely true that you can not really kill yourself by biting your tongue off. Their biting your tongue off has been almost a kind of fictional way of killing yourself in Asian culture for a long time. You find a lot of Chinese stories and Chinese accounts of people dying from biting their tongue off. But... So biting your tongue off to kill yourself is actually appears in so many Chinese and Japanese things that the fact that you cannot really do it is sort of very murky. It's like a murky truth. You can bite your tongue off and you can bleed and you can die from the infection. You might choke on the piece of tongue that you bit off the possibility of you bleeding to death or choking on your own blood is pretty hard because you'd be, I, I'm not sure it's really possible that you can bite your tongue off far enough back to really get at the artery. There's an artery that comes up to your tongue, but it is really, you know, it's really, really very little once you get to the part of your tongue that you can really bite. Now, I'm, I'm, little, I'm kind of messing around with my own tongue in my own mouth. Now, I'm not sure you can get far enough back to truly... I don't know if you could actually bite. I mean, if you're determined enough, you could probably bypass your brain's like warning signals and your brain's impulse does not bite down. But I don't think you could even bite down far back enough to do enough damage to your tongue for the bite itself to kill you like within minutes. You would have to bleed out or choke on your blood or possibly choke on the piece of your tongue. Maybe, I mean, it's possible if you if you manage to bite off a piece of your tongue and then deliberately try to choke on that piece of your tongue. I suppose that's possible. More than likely, um, this is a case of what, it, of what I was saying on the forums of reconstructed narrative, meaning that nobody really knows what happened to the guy. He probably had the plan that he was going to get caught, that he was going to say these certain lines, and that he would kill himself. And then nobody really saw what happened, but they know that the plan worked. And so therefore, because the plan worked, or maybe somebody saw it, but they saw it from far away. He bled. Maybe he took an arsenic pill 
before the fight broke out and 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 then so by the time the fight was they were getting to the part where he's saying his lines the arsenic was already taking effect and possibly causing him I mean, it's not a guarantee that the arsenic will cause you to vomit blood, but it's a potential. It is a potential side effect of taking a large dose of arsenic. Is would be to vomit blood up. So maybe he took a massive dose of arsenic, and then got caught, and then set his lines, and then maybe somebody viewing it from far away just saw him coughing up a bunch of blood and thought, oh, he bit his tongue off or something. You know, um, the point is, is that how he died and so we got to we have to understand that nobody was right there witnessing it exactly happen this is what in anthropology is an ethno historian somebody who is well trained and been to university and has a degree in this just listen to me for a second guys it's what's called reconstructive it's a uh, it's reconstructive narrative and that means that nobody was really there uh, but this is the way that it has been agreed upon by the survivors or the people who didn't die that this is how it's going to be remembered reconstructive narrative is not fan fiction reconstructive narrative is not a lie reconstructive narrative may not be forensically accurate but it is still culturally historically and sociologically meaningful because it gives us an insight into what the expectations of the people involved are. It's very similar to the whole thing with the Bin Laden raid in modern times. Nobody really knows what happened in the Bin Laden raid except for the SEALs that were there. But this brings up the other issue. Eyewitness testimony. Each SEAL is going to remember a different version of the stories the versions may be very similar but there will be discrepancies because we're each experiencing our own version of reality and we're going to have memories that match in some ways and differ in some ways if you remember when the whole you know when zero dark 30 the movie came out and all the and the different people wrote books about what happened and shit there was a question about why are they all telling a similar yet different story why is the story not matching up that's totally to be expected it it would be impossible for every member of SEAL Team 6 to tell the exact same story with the exact same details unless it was a unless it was a crafted story that they memorized to tell the only time that all members of any kind of like black ops operation would ever tell you the exact same story with the exact same details as if that story had been rehearsed because anybody who studies human beings, psychology, sociology, anthropology, law enforcement officers, um, military intel people, private investigators, all right, uh, people that work in law offices that do like affidavits, uh, uh, there's other fields of people, so, uh, security guards, whatever. You guys, and we all, we all know that eyewitness reports are heavily biased. Eyewitness reports are going to have a difference. People are not lying. People are not writing fan fiction. People are not creating shit. People just see things a certain way. They misremember a tad bit. They see something in a way that their brain has interpreted it this way. There's so many different reasons why I, two people at the same event, verified to be at the same event at the same time, participating in the same activity, are not going to tell you the exact same story. But what happens is, you still that doesn't mean that you reject their stories what it means is is you have to look at all the different stories as a collective so like for the bin laden raid and then this is where we get into the to the uh the the reconstructed narrative for the bin laden raid it's bin laden held up one of his wives uh, you know as a body shield and then the seal shot him in the face whether or not this is exactly what happened because there's discrepancies within the within the collective but but we but we expect that we don't expect to have a perfect forensically provable no discrepancy story as a historian as an anthropologist i don't i i would feel i don't want a single 
version of the story. I want multiple versions of the story. I want an official story because that's culturally and socially significant, but I also want multiple versions of the story. So that the, the, the main version of the story. So anyway, what we're getting at here with this tongue biting event, the main version of the story, just like the main version of the Bin Laden story, it, in this particular case, it's not, it doesn't exactly matter how the shinobi committed suicide, whether he really bit his tongue off, whether he swallowed a cyanide pill, whatever, or an arsenic pill. The point of the matter is that he committed suicide, right? And, and so we have to look at the overarching. The people who tell this story have this recollected narrative and there's been this, and it's meaningful, it's sociological, it's culturally meaningful, the way that the recollected narrative has been constructed. So to dismiss the reconstructive narrative as fan fiction is not only recklessly ignorant to how history and culture work, but it's also extremely disrespectful to the person presenting the recollected narrative. Olga Sawara is not just some random motherfucker. Olga Sawara is a highly respected member of a highly respected house. And to call Hibbs' work mere fan fiction is egregiously insulting and shows either a person's inability to behave in public and to not shit talk great people in public, or it shows that you don't know anything about the people that you're commenting on. So Olga Sawara cannot be just dismissed as some random fanfic writer he's Olga Sawara for fuck's sakes you know like Olga Sawara is presenting a recollective narrative whether or not it's perfectly true is not really the point the point is is what is being said is culturally and historically meaningful because that is the narrative that has been agreed upon and recollected it has been constructed to this way it's just, again, like the Bin Laden raid. It would be like saying that the Bin Laden raid never existed because the Navy SEALs can't seem to give the, the, the same version of the story. And so therefore the Navy SEALs must just be having fan fiction because they're all telling a different version of the story. Some of the story matches, some of it differs. If they all can't agree on the same version of the story, then it must have never been happening and these Navy SEALs are just fan fiction writers. That's what you're saying when you're saying that Olga Sawara is just a fan fiction writer. <coughs> you're just basically saying, oh, because the story doesn't jive 100% with forensic reality, that it's just, it's fiction, it's fan fiction, throw it away. Is is really reckless and irresponsible. It's reckless socially and it's reckless academically to say that. The thing about, and going about the thing with the SEAL Team 6 is, it's significant, it's socially and culturally important when we see the recollective narrative that we've agreed upon, we as a society accept that version of the story because we expect Bin Laden to have done something cowardly and we expect our SEALs to have summarily punished him for it. If the story said that they went up to Bin Laden's room and he was up there having tea and the Navy SEAL sat down with him and had a chat for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, drank some tea with him, discussed life, politics, and spirituality. And at the end of the conversation, Bin Laden agreed to shoot himself. And so they handed him a pistol and he did the work himself in a very honorable way. We would all be like, what the fuck? We would never accept that. Ironically, we would never accept that even even if all the Navy SEALs, you know, put their hand on the Bible and swear that that's really what happened. We as a society would say, what the fuck? That is a lie. That is because it would completely dish jive with our social expectations. Because this story jives with our social expectations, not only can we learn something about what very well may have happened at the event, but we can learn more about what we as a society, us, expect from the story. And so therefore, the tongue-biting incident and everything that is in this story speaks volumes about what Shinobi no Mono, Shinobi no Samurai, expect from shinobi themselves so the the culture the subculture of samurai trained in shinobi arts expect 
it to end like this, expect it to happen like this. And they can accept this version of the narrative and they can draw value from this version of the narrative. Because, and that, that speaks to what the overall subculture of samurai trained in ninjutsu believe and value and expect. It's not fan fiction just because it may not be 100% accurate. All right, and the, the last thing I want to touch on is another thing in a video that Anthony said about geek ninjas. This is kind of a trend that I'm seeing appearing. You guys have to remember that, yes, shinobi are samurai. Yes, obviously. But you need to stop equating ninja with being hard-ass warriors. And Anthony, you've... And Anthony, like, I mean, I know what you're trying to do, but, and you're not really the one doing it so bad, but I'm seeing a lot of other people out there. Honestly, I would say that you need to equate samurai with being hard asses, but you need to really understand, like, the cerebral foundation of the shinobi arts. The shinobi arts are consisted of two major parts, the original part and the add-on part. The original part of shinobi is to outthink your opponent to deceive them the original shinobi art is to pretend to be someone else so that you can collect information on the enemy and that you can meet with enemies and secure betrayals that's the original shinobi art then you tack on the art of thievery the art of sneaking into places when you take the original art of pretending to be somebody else to gather information and to secure betrayals and you put it together with the thieving art of sneaking in and stealing shit you then give birth to all the things like sneaking in and setting fires or sneaking in and assassinating or doing this da, 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 da. it creates all of this and all those become extensions of those two but the original but according and, I, and of course I'm coming from the Hachiman Daibo Satsu tradition, the Kusunokiru tradition, the basically the Southern Court way of thinking, is that ninjutsu and the Bansen Shukai says it itself that yonin is hijitsu. So hijitsu, the original art which gave birth to ninjutsu, hijitsu coming from the late 900s from um, Ginji Yorimitsu, right, Lord Raiko, right, <coughs> from that tradition of investigate a samurai pretending to be other people while they investigate and then once they investigate they manipulate the people and the world around their target once and then at that point the ninjutsu is is goes away and you just rely on on whatever your bujutsu or whatever your art is right so in a way as a samurai your ninjutsu is your cerebral part it's your it is your geeky part it's your code breaker part it's your linguist part it's your sociologist your anthropologist it's your private investigator you 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 pretend to be someone else you investigate your enemy so you find out where your enemy is and what their strengths are and then you manipulate their their power structure in order to get an advantage and once all that happens ninjutsu gets put down and then you pick up kinjutsu and you cut their head off but your ability to get in the same room with them to cut their head off requires you to have the ninjutsu but then when you get in the same room with them, you don't use ninjutsu to cut his head off. You use kinjutsu to cut his head off. So as a samurai, you need to be a hard ass because you got to be able to win the fight. But being a hard ass to be the private investigator or, you know, to be the investigator or to be the linguist or to be the cipher, or to be the anthropologist is a little is a little goofy. You know, there's all these memes. People are putting up all these posts about ninja, have, you know, being these fucking like, you know, hardcore warriors and shit and whatever. I say, no, guys, guys, as a samurai, you need to be a warrior. But as a shinobi, you need to be a linguist. You need to be an investigator. You need to be cerebral. It's all about mind games. It's all about code breaking the enemy's power structure. Right? So 
the part of, and then now when we get into the thieving skills the part about sneaking into places and shit like that yes now that required you know so it's like oh well you need to be fit enough to climb or you need to be fit enough to do this this yeah 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 there, there's an aspect to that but the heart of shinobi i i say i argue from the hachiman bosatsu tradition is the 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 deception and the investigation and that's more cerebral than it is physical so I would say, yeah, I guess for the sneaking and breaking and entering, you need to be somewhat physically fit. But really, you have to be a smart motherfucker. You can't be all brawn and no brains. That's that a ninja does not make. Right. So you guys just be careful because I see a lot of you associating ninjutsu with being like a well muscled, well toned martial artist. And that's just that's not really correct. Like you do need to be healthy and you do need to be fit. And you do need to be skilled as as a samurai. You need those things, but for a shinobi specifically, those things aren't really that required. I mean, yes, you need to be fit for like climbing castle walls and shit. That obviously, but the hijitsu part, you need to be smart. So don't remember if you have just the skills of the thief, but you don't have the other skills. You then you're just a thief, right? So, I think that the inter- uh, you got a lot of you guys on the internet are falling back to associating ninjutsu with being a shadow, running around in the dark, and you guys really need to go back to the heart of ninjutsu, which is military intel, or you know what I mean, it's intel, it's getting data and disrupting, getting data for your side, disrupting data on the other side. And the one part, the key thing, and this is fucking killing me, you guys, securing betrayals is like the fucking heart of ninjutsu. Getting people to betray their own side or setting it up to make it look like they've betrayed their own side is like the primary fucking point of ninjutsu. Ninja, well, like, like if ninjutsu has, if the heart of ninjutsu manifests in two distinct ways, it's investigating your enemies and then securing betrayals. Like, I can't express that enough. Everybody wants to talk about sneaking around at night and that shit is almost always done by lesser agents. You can go into the enemy territory and you can secure betrayals of low-ranking local samurai who will do all of the sneaking into castles and shit for you. You might be a crippled fat ass who is a successful ninja because you can get other people to throw their lives away for you. Because being the ninja, the ninja, the ninshi, the shinobi no samurai, many times through history has been, you know, a well hardened battle veteran. That's true. I'm not saying that didn't happen, but I'm saying in spirit, the shinobi no samurai is the guy sitting there in the dark, talking someone into doing that shit for them you don't want to send a well-trained battle-hardened spy into a castle on a mission that is probably going to get him killed you just you really just don't want to do that you know it takes a long time to be trained a proper ninja what you want to do is you want to send that well-trained ninja into enemy territory and then have him convince local low-ranking people to throw their lives away that way like the post I said, espionage is like flipping a coin so long as the coin belongs to someone else. You can, you can lose countless low-level ninja in an operation. It's fine because they were enemy samurai anyway. That is a key point, you know. So going back to the Hachiman de Bosatsu tradition where it's like with uh, Lord Genji Yorimitsu who and his warriors disguise themselves as Yamabushi who have broken their vows and then they investigate the mountainside they find where the thieves are they trick the thieves into letting them in and then once they're in there they poison them and kill them and rescue all the girls that is like the heart of ninjutsu it's about where is my enemy 
Like, who is my enemy? Where is my enemy? Once you find your enemy, once you locate your enemy, how do I get into my enemy? How do I get the advantage over the enemy? How do I put the enemy into a position where I can then capture and or kill them? <coughs> and that comes from investigating the enemy, tricking the enemy, deceiving the enemy, securing betrayals from the enemy, getting enemy servants and retainers to turn against the enemy. It's all about weakening the defensive structures around the enemy so that you can get in the same room at the same place at the same time with a weakened enemy and then either capture them or take their head. And I think that it's just really, really important that you guys remember that the root of all this is investigation and securing betrayals. And again, when I say securing betrayals, I don't always mean you get a general to betray. I mean, you get low ranking guys to betray their side so that they will do all of the creeping in, sneaking, lock picking shit for you. Cause you can teach somebody how to break and enter in just a few weeks. You can teach somebody how to crawl, sneak, walk silently, pick locks and shit in just a couple of weeks and then send them off. If they get caught and they die, again, they were an enemy resource. You've lost nothing. And that is the spirit of ninjutsu. And so please, guys, like for the sake of ninjutsu, stop trying to equate ninjutsu with direct combat. Ninjutsu, yes, as a samurai, you will engage in direct combat, but that, but the ninjutsu part, the ninjutsu part is the, the investigation and the deception. The direct combat part is just the life of a samurai in general. So, I would argue that geeky ninja are the good ninja, because they're the ones that are devoted to the arts of linguistics and psychology and code cracking and things like that. So anyway... All right, that's the end of my rant for now. Leave your comments below if you feel thus inclined.